I think it's uh, it's uh, uh, rare when you meet someone. I'm sure you've all had this feeling that you meet somebody and you say to yourself, you know, I can't imagine that person doing anything else with their life, right? That person is the quintessential uh, professor, or that guy's the quintessential lawyer, or a judge, or what have you. And, uh, you know, I think all of us from time to time think to ourselves, you know, how are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? And I, and I, I remember one time that I asked back then, Father Cantu, who's now Bishop Cantu of Las Cruces, uh, I said, you know, uh, Bishop, how is it that you knew you were doing what you were supposed to be doing? And he said, well, it's funny, Roger. He says, you know, I, I got that feeling very early on when I became a parish priest. I said, really? Yeah. He says, uh, there was a fellow by the name of Frank Gomez. I said, okay. And he said, yeah, you know, Frank, we got close and whatnot, but I always had the feeling that Frank was holding back. He wasn't telling me something. I approached Frank and I said to Frank, Frank, you know, meet with me. Let's talk about, you know, what's going on with your life. You know, maybe you can even go to confession. We'll set up something for you to go to confession. <laughs> Frank said, no, 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 I'm fine. No, you don't need to worry about me. I'm, I'm good to go, uh, Bishop. And uh, one day, the uh, father is sitting in his office, and the phone rings. And he says, uh, hello, is this Father Tantu? <coughs> yes, it is. Uh, I'm calling from the Internal Revenue Service. Can you help me? Yes, I can. <coughs> Do you know Frank Gomez? Yes, I do. Did he give your church $10,000? Yes, he will. <laughs> <laughs> See, Bishop Kantu said that he realized at that moment that, that he had a sixth sense about him, you know, that he understood what was going on. And I don't know about I think I speak for everyone in the room that, you know, we're very fortunate to have a speaker today that has sort of a sixth sense about the criminal justice system. It's not something that you can really put your finger on. It's just a, a, an aura or a sense that you get that the solutions that are being fashioned in that committee will help. And that's a very important thing these days, is to have solutions that help, right? Not solutions that don't help. So, you know, Senator Whitmire has developed a, a sixth sense, and, a, and he's shepherded some of the most important criminal justice legislation, and I think most here would agree that he's made the right decision to enter public service as a legislature. He's, uh, in 1973, our keynote speaker was just 23-year-old college dropout living in Houston when he ran for a seat in the House of Representatives and won. In 1983, he was elected to the Senate, and in 1993, he was tapped to be the chairman of the Texas Senate Criminal Justice Committee. In 2003, he was one of the Texas 11, a group of Democrats who fled the state for New Mexico in a uh, quorum sort of busting effort aimed at preventing the passage of controversial redistricting. And after they made their point, they came back to the table and worked together. Right? That's the important part the coming back to the table and working together. Uh, today, <clears throat> Senator Whitmire is the dean of the Senate, and unlike the university, there is only one dean. He's the dean. Mm -hmm. um, so he is the dean, and today, Senator, has been uh, named by Texas Monthly, the Texas Best Legislator in 1993, 2003, 2005, and 2011. The Senator has worked hard to bring about needed changes to the adult and juvenile criminal justice systems. And he stressed the need to be tough but smart on crime. He's noted for spearheading the reform of the treatment and rehabilitation of offenders. We, some of the uh, folks in this room have, uh, have uh, uh, done evaluations of residential substance abuse treatments in, uh, in prisons for the Legislative Budget Board. And uh, have, have, have had the opportunity to work closely with this committee. So, without further ado, I want to introduce our keynote today, none other than Senator Whitmire. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. I'll probably introduced in the last four 
20 years of public service, I don't know, I know hundreds of times, maybe a thousand or more. That was darn unique. That was darn unique to be, to, to be compared with the bishop. <laughs> what well, he's doing. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, Dr. Hartley, in your short time here, you pulled off what many academic presidents and chancellors can't do. Get a state senator who sits on finance to come to their campus. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's really there's a message there. Uh, you invite me because of the topic, but you got a member of finance to come see your campus, uh, and that's where it begins. You got to have a face on the budget, and when you come before finance in the future, you know, they'd be wise if they bring you to Austin and let you go before finance, because now I'm gonna know you. I've heard of your refined programs, so uh, UT, San Tom, I would consider you a real asset, not only because of your teachings, but because of now your connections. So <laughs> you got me here this morning, and uh, I have a lot of demands. But you did uh, approach my office, and it sounded like a worthwhile coming together of, uh, of minds. Uh, it was interesting you said I was a dropout. That's the only thing that kind of I'm a little sensitive about. <laughs> <laughs> And, and the New York Times had an article earlier this year, and they said I was a dropout. Well, that reporter was a jerk. Uh, I, know, I know you didn't mean it like he did. What I actually did my senior year at U of H, I was 22, I was working my way through U of H like so many students do, and I went by a professor's office to ask for more time for a paper, and he was looking at a redistricting map. In 1972, the Supreme Court said that you no longer would run countywide because you could not appreciate the one man, one vote uh, concept. That if you have to run countywide, uh, you got to have too much money and uh, be on a slate. So they divided Houston into 26 legislative districts, uh, about 150,000 people at that time. And so my professor said, Where do you live? And I said, I live right here in Northwest Houston. He said, Well, you know, there's no incumbent. There's no one currently in the legislature that they do a line swap. I said, wow, my high school's there, my church is there, my mother's a nurse there. I'd always been interested, I was studying political science. So I went home and told my parents, I'd say $5,000 to go to law school, and I said, I would like to stay out next spring and run for the legislature. And can you imagine? And, and, and I do believe in divine intervention. <laughs> my father said, well, you might as well. All he would have had to have said was, you've got the rest of your life to run for office. You need to get your education. But I stayed out, got me some cars and some yard signs. There were five people in that race. I got in to run off with one of the business candidates. And then in the fall, I was so young, the Republicans thought for sure they'd knock off this student. And I won in the fall, and then 10 years in the House, and I went to the Senate in 83. And it's been about 40 years of public service. Uh, I do think, uh, as you said, there, there is a calling. I think to be a professor, to be a law enforcement, to be a judge, you can, you can just detect those who want to enjoy the work and will work extra hard to make a difference. And I've been very blessed and, and still I think there's a lot uh, of good that that's, we haven't reached yet. But let me quickly talk about the criminal justice system and then if we get through, if you have some questions, I would be more than glad to answer. First of all, I want to emphasize, and, and I know I'm talking to a lot of practitioners, a pre-trial release director I uh, set up a little too long ago, those academic folks, but I know to some degree I'm singing to the choir, but let me just kind of give you my perspective on the state level of where we've been, where we are, and some challenges. Certainly, I would, I would use your resources to solve some problems that are still outstanding. First of all, you've got to realize, and it is such a chore to get legislators to understand it, is our criminal justice system is, in fact, a system. Think about that for a moment. It is a huge system, and it begins, I'll start with the police officers and law enforcement on the street. It actually begins sooner when you detect a, 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 a student having difficulty 
staying in to sleep. My, my daughter taught second grade a couple years ago in Houston. And she said, Dad, if you, if someone in the school district doesn't get this young man some help, at 10 o'clock he gets on the top of the slide, he is so angry because they actually bring him from a homeless shelter in downtown Houston to her inner city elementary school. At 10 o'clock, Angel, of all names, would push and just challenge anybody to come to the top of the slide. And he'd push you off. And my daughter, very young teacher, would come and say, if he doesn't get some help, you might as well go to a prison cell for him. Get ready. He will be one of your inmates. Very, pers very prospective young lady. So actually, I could go as far back as preschool, in the cradle, etc. But let's start, for my purposes this morning, where we really start regulating the criminal justice system with our officers on the street. It goes right up through the prosecution, goes through the courts, probation, and even after, obviously, the prison system. But when you have a parolee that can't conform with the rules of parole, what you do with that individual probably affects the front end. It impacts who the officer or the support system is going to have the space and the resources to deal with the next person that comes into the system. So what I'm trying to impress upon you is we're all in this together from the street cop to the parole officer and everybody in between. Now let me quickly give you a snapshot of where we were in 1993. There's a lot of young people in here that were probably having fun in 1993. But I was a member of the Senate, had never served on criminal justice, was not a criminal defense lawyer, and Bob Bowen, Lieutenant Governor, called me in his office and said, the chairman of criminal justice lost his re-election, and I want you to take over criminal justice. And I said, no, no, no. I thought the fix was on to ruin my career. <laughs> in 1993, ladies and gentlemen, our criminal justice system was totally dysfunctional. We had 100, we had 60,000 people in prison, 60,000 in prison, 30,000 were backed up in our county jails, sleeping on the floor because we didn't have prison capacity for them. What happened was crack cocaine came into our communities in the late 80s, early 90s, and caught all law enforcement and penal institutions by surprise. It was largely drug, largely cocaine driven. It was leading to Violence. It was leading to home burglaries. Just it was it was overwhelming the system. You were serving one month for every year that you were sentenced to prison. It was a revolving door. You get a ten-year prison sentence. It was not uncommon to get out in less than a year. Some people were actually paroled from the jail and never reached prison. It was a totally dysfunctional system. So I didn't want to do it because I thought, quite frankly, it was almost beyond fixing. And so did a lot of other things. And it was also a national phenomenon, quite frankly. But here in Texas, we had to deal with it. It was you know, it, it, the public routinely would put criminal justice at the top of their polls. You ask people, what are your major concerns? Criminal justice was right up near the top. Today, it's interesting. Of course we're still concerned about some of the horrible crimes we read about. We still get our homes broken into. We still got a crime problem. But it's not dysfunctional. Today, public safety doesn't want really to show up on the polls. It's way behind water, transportation, and health care, and jobs, et cetera, et cetera. So how did we fix it? First, we went into a huge expansion program. We spent in the 90s about $3 billion on new prisons. I came up, I say I came up, I shot a bear. Uh, I had a lot of help with prosecutors, crime victims, judges, probation officers. We came up, we're overwhelmed, what do we do? The first, the first thought process was we can't treat all the inmates the same. Under the dysfunctional system, we would let out a rapist to put in a car thief. It was crazy. You put in a you let out a violent guy to put in a non-violent guy. So immediately, I just country common sense said we can't treat all the inmates the same. You got to distinguish who you're afraid of versus who you're mad at. So we came up with the concept of state jails. 
not a hard prison, but a metallic building where you serve up to two years for nonviolent, low-level drug offenses. They could be built quicker, programming, GED, education, drug and counseling was, was going to be the, one of the highest priorities. But we did this huge expansion in the 90s, and I did start, even in the 90s, talking about drug and alcohol. Remember I said, you can't, you can't, you got to classify inmates. you got to know who you, who you really want to lock up. Murders, rapists, child molesters, lock them up and, and keep them locked up. But somebody with a drinking problem, if they're not drinking, we're not afraid of them. We know you can fix someone's drug dependence with proper counseling and treatment. It requires resources. So we did some of that in the 90s, but a lot of pushback. Governor Bush came along just about the time we were really getting into drug and alcohol treatment. And Governor Bush said, hey. He was the first guy to look at me. Hey. I quit drinking on my own when I was 40. I woke up after an all-night drunk and my wife said, if you don't quit drinking, he's actually written and talked about this, but he told me it's done. When, when I was 40, my wife gave me an ultimatum. I got to quit drinking and she was going to leave me. I said, go. You didn't have, you, you, you had a behavior problem. <laughs> and you had a strong wife. And you had a family of resources. I'm not talking, I'm talking about people that have generations of drug and alcohol abuse. They're dropout. They can't get a job. So I got a lot of pushback, but we did build a ton of prisons. Today we have 108 prisons. Today we have 150,000 inmates. Remember I told you 60,000, 30 backed up in the jails. Today we have 150,000 inmates at 108 locations. That is one and a half Waco, Texas. Drive through Waco. Fairly large community, we lock up, feed, clothe, guard, provide health care for one and a half way to Texas every day. Huge system. Fast forward to about seven years ago, we're out of capacity again. We're out of prison space again seven years ago. The Lieutenant Governor, David Dewhurst, and others still thought it's a political <coughs> Attractive thing to do, let's build more prisons. We've got to be tough. And so they wanted to build three new prisons. Expensive, hard prisons. And I sat on finance next to the chair, Steve Ogden from College Station. And I said, Steve, and I had been chairing since 93, so the legislature would listen to me. I said, we've got all the hard, tough prisons we need. We can't even manage the ones we have. We normally, any given day, are about 2,500 correction officers short of what we need to have safe prisons. We can't run the ones we've got. Trust me, we've got enough hard prisons. What we don't have is enough treatment beds. So through a lot of hard work and a partner, Jerry Madden, who was a house member, engineer, had little experience with criminal justice, but he was analytical, he listened to me and he became a, a vocal supporter of mine in the House. Got to keep in mind, I'm a good Democrat in the House and Senate is controlled by Republicans. So I started out having to work a little harder <laughs> than some. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, instead of three new big secure prisons, we created 6,000 treatment beds. A little over $200 million worth of treatment beds. Now let me quickly tell you how it works. Because not a week goes by that someone in the other states and often foreign countries, Britain, uh, parliament members came to see us recently. How'd you do it? They always wonder how you sold it. That was one thing. The politicians I deal with, first the Oklahoma Speaker of the House came to me and said, how'd you sell this? Well, first you have to establish that you're tough on crime. And, then, and no one in this room should doubt that we are tough on crime in the state of Texas. I'm tough on crime. Violent offenders ought to be locked up for long, long periods of time. And we do a hell of a good job of it. But let me tell you what we started six years ago. We created 6,000 treatment beds. On the front end, probationers. Probationers who a judge decides is a good risk, and I will leave you in the community, often violate their probation. They either test positive for drugs, alcohol, they get in a dispute, they just are having a tough time complying with probation. And in the past, 
we would revoke them. And at one time, we were actually sending more people to prison as a result of probation revocations than we were from direct sentencing from the court. So we created substance abuse treatment facilities. We have them across Texas, about a half a dozen. If you're a probationer and you just can't conform to the terms of your probation, but a judge says, I'm not going to give up on you. Let me, let me digress here a moment. A judge taught me years ago, you can always send somebody to prison. That's the easiest thing a judge can do. Just send them to prison. I clear my docket and move to the next problem. Don't give up on an individual is one of the hardest things you have to do in the judiciary or in the criminal justice system. So now as a condition of probation, you don't conform, you test positive, you don't get a job, you test positive for cocaine, you will go to a substance abuse treatment facility run by the state of Texas for six months. Intense counseling, GED received, re-entry program, and it is, it is reducing the number of people that go to prison. We also have very little therapeutic treatment inside the prison. It is a shame that you would go to prison for a drug or alcohol crime and not receive that treatment while you're in prison. We're doing a lot better there, but we still need an additional. Here's one that works like a charm. Remember I said it's a system. We parole about 70,000 people a year. It's an amazing turnaround, isn't it? Mostly nonviolent drug and alcohol related offenses. Parolees will have a bad day, just like you and I do. They, they have really bad days because they can't, they're labeled, they're profiled. Try applying for a job and give your last, your last addresses, Huntsville, Texas, the LSU. And you know, I tell young people, once you get labeled, once you get in the system, it's a stacked deck against you. But parolees, will have a bad day, and I'm not talking about committing a new crime. Technical violations are common among parolees. What's that mean? You don't show up for your scheduled meeting with your parole officer. You test positive for alcohol, and our marijuana, and our drugs. You have to pay your parole fees. You get in a dispute with your domestic partner. Law enforcement's called. No charges. If you commit a new crime, you're in a different category. I'm talking about screw-ups. I'm talking about people that are having a hard time conforming to our very firm parole rules that we want you to follow. In the past, you violate those rules, we would revoke you and send you back to prison to start over. In fact, we had only give you credit for the good time that you had on the streets, which I think ought to be adjusted, but I can't. I haven't convinced my colleagues. If you're two years on the streets as a good parolee, and we send you back to finish your sentence, I think you ought to get credit for the two years. But anyway, that's something I'm working on. Instead of revoking a parole and sending the person back to prison, we now go to an intermediate sanction facility. There's one in downtown Houston, right outside our ballpark. It's a nondescript four-story building. This morning there's about 400 parolees there that are having difficulty conforming to the rules of parole. And instead, when that population of our prison was skyrocketing, they go there for 90 days to adjust their attitude and realize how serious we are about their parole expectations, but they don't have, they haven't committed a new crime. That is working tremendously. Now, one other example. Remember, I always thought you got to distinguish who's violent, who's nonviolent. DWI offenders will kill you, drinking and driving will kill you just like a gun. Gun. But if the person's not drinking, we're not afraid of it. This morning we have about 3,500 people locked up in our prisons for their third or more DWI. It's an amazing number. Harris County routinely the third DWI, so felony, they'll lock you up for five years. I asked a pro chairman one time, Ms. Owens, I said, why do you keep someone with a five-year sentence for a DWI the entire five years? Other offenses, good time, pro considerations, you'd let them out in two or three, or something short of the fact. She said, Senator, because you are, because the, the prison system does such a poor job of treating DWI offenders, we know they're going to reoffend. I think that's a hell of a comment. 
in our society. We know they're going to reoffend because they're not getting treatment for alcohol. And so we're going to at least keep them off the streets for the five years. I said, well, what if I come up with this model? Today in Henderson, Texas, part of this treatment mode that I and others passed six years ago, there are 500 DWI offenders. I wanted it, I, I, I still lose the balance. It, it's nuts that it's in a rural, remote setting of Henderson, DB, Texas, but I don't win all my battles. It, it should be near San Antonio, Houston, or Dallas. Houston, San Antonio, Dallas furnishes about 80% of, of, of the prison traffic. But it's in Henderson, 500 guys today, and we just started one for women in Marble Falls. They don't go to the fields, they don't go to the manufacturing shop, they go to class. And they're in there with other DWI offenders. And it is showing great rewards. They are coming out and not real thin. The sad news is I only have 500 of those beds and we need several thousand more. You have to distinguish who you're mad at versus who you're afraid of. Now let me shift because the adult system, I'm here to tell you, is working pretty darn good. <laughs>